Hello and welcome. My name is Maxim Schreier. I'm a professor at Boston College and an associate at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies here at Harvard, where I have the pleasure of curating the seminar on Russian and Eurasian Jewry. I want to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, presentation by our, by our very distinguished guest, Professor Yohanan Petrovsky Stern, whom I will introduce shortly. Allow me just to make a few comments, one of which is the usual words of thanks to our sponsors, uh, of course, the Davis Center and also the Center for Jewish Studies here at Harvard. Thank you very much for supporting the work of this seminar and to Laura Sargent and all her colleagues for making this possible. I also want to highlight uh, the rest of our programmatic activities this spring. So we have two events coming up. Uh, they're all on the Davis Center events calendar. On the 22nd of March, we will have uh, Julia Regal, who will be speaking about music in the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, on the 19th of April, we'll have uh, Marat Greenberg, who will be speaking about Soviet uh, science fiction and uh, various uh, Jewish, Russian and Jewish Ukrainian connections. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, this is the most immodest part of uh, this introduction, uh, not in my seminar, but as part of uh, the Davis Center's activities on March 20th, uh, there'll be a launch of my new book, mm, Immigrant Baggage, which uh, will be a conversation that uh, Alexandra Vakru, the executive director of the center, will be moderating. And this is an in-person event. And of course, you all invite it. And now, without further ado, let me introduce uh, our distinguished guest, my very good friend, Yohanan Petrovsky Stern of uh, Northwestern University, who is a native of Kiev and a scion of uh, a literary family, and who is the crown family professor of Jewish studies in the history department at Northwestern, where he teaches a variety of courses that include early modern and modern Jewish history, Jewish material culture, and of course, the history and culture of Ukraine. Uh, Professor Petrovsky Stern has published uh, more than 100 articles and more than a dozen books and edited volumes. I'm going to highlight some of them. Um, I have personally learned from them a great deal and benefited from their existence. Uh, the Jews in the Russian army drafted into modernity, the anti-imperial choice, the making of the Ukrainian Jew, Lenin's Jewish question, Jews and Ukrainians, which was a special volume of Pauline, co-edited with Antoni Petro Balonsky, Cultural Interference of Jews and Ukrainians, a Field in the Making, The Golden Age Shtetl, A New History of Jewish Life in Eastern Europe, and uh, a book that I particularly admire, Jews and Ukrainians, A Millennium of Coexistence, co-authored with Paul Robert Magoshi, which uh, uh, in 2018 came out in its second edition. Professor Petrovsky Stern's essays, books, and book chapters have appeared in a number of languages, among them Spanish, Ukrainian, of course, Polish, Russian, Hebrew, and German. For his expertise, uh, he has been appointed Fulbright Specialist in Eastern Europe, a fellow at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, a professor at the Free Ukrainian University in Munich, a recurrent visiting professor at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, and the Lady Davis Professor at Hebrew University in, of Jerusalem, and also the Kostushko Visiting Professor at Warsaw University. And finally, let me mention the honorary doctorate that uh, our guest received from the National University Kiev Mohila Academy in Kiev. Uh, I also would like to add, uh, perhaps on a somewhat more sentimental note, that uh, our guest is uh, a, a distinguished visual artist. Uh, and if you saw the head title for today's uh, event, this was uh, Yohanan's uh, work of art. Uh, and I am very, very pleased to be able to feature that as well. And uh, the 
subject of uh, our guest presentation, of course, is particularly relevant today. We are entering the second month of the second year of uh, the brutal war that Putin's Russia is fighting in Ukraine. And uh, while it is a slight stretch, I do think that the timing of today's lecture is uh, at least slightly fortuitous because we are just celebrated Purim, which for Jews of the former Soviet Union has special significance because of uh, Stalin's death on March 5th, 1953. And the slight, uh, I guess, stretching of the evidence would be to suggest that perhaps this Purim season of 2023 will uh, also give us a chance to celebrate the deliverance of Ukraine from the hands of uh, Russia's murderous tyrant. And uh, uh, Yohanan, I'm really delighted to have you with us. The title of Professor Petrovsky Stern's presentation is People of the Cossack Stock, Ethnic Minorities and Russian-Ukrainian War. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me well? Great, great. Um, I'm delighted to be um, with the um, uh, listeners, participants, um, colleagues um, who are joining our webinar on um, uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. Um, I will talk about peoples of the, people of the Kazakh stock, ethnic minorities, and Russian-Ukrainian war. And uh, uh, Maxim, thank you very much for this uh, wonderful um, introduction. Uh, when I lived in Moscow as a graduate student uh, in the early 1980s, I could always identify Ukrainians in a crowd. They walked with their knees slightly bent. In November 1993, after my lecture at the Harriman Institute in New York, I had a conversation with Alex Motil, one of the Institute directors, a political scientist, writer, and artist, intimately familiar with modern Ukraine and a great wit. I told him about Ukrainians in Moscow who walked like insecure second-class citizens. Let's drink, Alex Motil observed over a pint of ale, to the day when Ukrainians will walk with their legs straight and their heads raised. In 2022, in the middle of the war, I was reminded of this toast by an essay of Gennady Druzhenko, a lawyer and paramedic who had set up a mobile frontline hospital in Eastern Ukraine. He wrote that the war allows us and the world to discover the beauty of things Ukrainian. This discovery of Ukrainian beauty gives us an amazing chance to overcome one of the main problems of Ukrainians, our inferiority complex. Not only compared to Russia, Druzhenko added, but also compared to the West. The Russian-Ukrainian war transformed the Ukrainian self-perception. The Ukrainian national bard, Taras Shevchenko, sarcastically described a stereotypical Ukrainian who crawled up to heaven and said with a deep sense of inferiority, we are not we, and I am not I. Якби ми вчились так, як треба, то і мудрість би була своя. А то залізете на небо, і ми не ми, і я не я. So we are not we, and I am not I. Shevchenko refer, was referring to a deeply rooted lack of national dignity. He described the insecure Ukrainians as Mongols, naked grandsons of the Golden Tamerlane, and as Slavs bad great-grandsons of the glorious great-grandfathers. He did not spare the Ukrainian noble landlords, calling them slaves, psychophants, Moscow dirt, Warsaw rubbish. In 2022, however, no longer inferior to their glorious ancestors, Ukrainians walked with their legs straight and their heads raised. The war radically changed them as a people. Ukrainians cast themselves in the mold of the glorious Cossack past. They remained the Cossacks. They remembered the Cossacks, not as unruly mercenaries at the boundaries of the southern steppe, but as urban, modern fighters loyal to national sovereignty. The new nation discovered its multicultural character and embraced the multiple ethnicities that joined the defense of the country. The xenophobic prejudices of the past, idiosyncratic to the early modern Cossacks, were left behind. Of course, this transformation did not occur overnight. In uh, the fall of 2022, inhabitants of Odessa 
decided to dismantle their monument to Catherine II, who had built the city on the territory of Cossack villages. For Odessans, it turned out to be more significant that Catherine had abolished the Cossack autonomy, the hetmanate. While the Tsarina considered the Cossacks rustic barbarians, the Odessans viewed them as the champions of Ukrainian self-determination. The Odessans could not forgive Catherine for destroying Cossack self-rule, an early form of Ukrainian independence. In the 19th century Russian Empire, Cossacks were a part of Malorossi, that is to say, little Russians. They had supposedly been redeemed from the Polish oppressors by the Velikorossi, the Russians, the great Russians, and then lived peacefully under the two-headed Russian eagle. As the result of the war of attrition, one of the Cossack communities ended up on the other side of the Danube under the Ottomans. As official legend had it, the Danube Cossacks yearned to join the great Russian people. This is the portrayal of the Cossacks in the Ukrainian comic opera, A Zaporozhian Cossack Behind the Danube, Zaporozhia Zedunayim, by Semen Hulak Artemovsky, produced in 1863. In the final act of the opera, a Cossack chorus performs a collective liturgy. Of course, influenced by Verdi's Nabucco, the Cossack blast uh, the day when the freedom will shine on them, and after much suffering in the Ottoman Empire, the Ukrainian land awaits them. The Cossacks, of course, are referring in their lyrics to the Ukraine, a Russian borderland, not to an independent country. The opera portrays the Cossacks as Kaiser Prau, obedient servants of the Russian Tsar, and stalwart patriots of the Russian Empire. The Cossacks, as it were, could regain their identity only when they returned from bondage to the embrace of the big brother. The inferiority complex of the Cossacks was salient in the scene, albeit the ambiguous Cossack quest for volia, freedom, was potentially explosive. A year later, in 1965, uh, Ukrainian ethnographer Pavlo Chubinsky composed a poem, Ukraine Had Not Died, which the Western uh, Ukrainian priest and composer Mikhailo Verbitsky set to music. The song portrayed Ukrainians as a people of Cossack stock and eventually became the Ukrainian national anthem. The opera and the song reconceptualized the Cossacks as the founding fathers of the nation and as a national metaphor. More than a hundred years passed before this vision could take hold. Soviet historians homogenized Cossacks as an oppressed peasant class. They also created a Soviet myth of the Cossacks placing them at the center of early modern class struggle for emancipation. They reimagined Cossacks as Soviet patriots who would always rebel against the Western, Polish, Catholic oppressors and seek protection of Russia. Around 1954, the 300th anniversary of the 1654 Periaslav Treaty, allying Ukraine and Muscovy, several Ukrainian historical novels were published. All but one of them promoted the myth of a long-awaited reunification of the Ukrainian and Russian peoples and portrayed subservient Cossacks as a rural subgroup from Ukraine, the stuff of legend. And of course, the only novel that did not follow the lead was written in the West, uh, actually in Germany, by an emigre Ukrainian writer, Yuri Kosich. The Russian-Ukrainian war radically changed this perception. Perhaps for the first time in Ukrainian history, the entire nation chose to identify as brethren of Kazakh stock. In the first days of the invasion, the song Red Viburnum, Oh, there is a Red Viburnum in the meadow, became as popular as a second national anthem. In the song, the new Cossacks came to challenge Russian imperial domination, raising a red viburnum to cheer up glorious Ukraine. The song was the march of the Ukrainian siege riflemen, Sichovistrelsi, who wore the Austrian army uniform during World War I, yet called themselves a siege, the administrative self-governing body of the Zaporizhia Cossacks. The connection was explicit. 
especially for Russian authorities who identify the siege riflemen as a treacherous followers of Hetman Mazepa, who had sought Kazakh autonomy outside Russian control in the late 17th, early 18th century. The Soviets, of course, banned the song. It was performed by the dissidents in the underground uh, and by a dissident-minded um, leader of the um, Hohmian uh, choir who uh, taught this song to the choir that was, again, performed um, in a clandestine manner in the Soviet Union. Two weeks into the Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, Andriy Hlivnyuk from the Ukrainian rock group Boombox recorded the song on Sofia Square in Kiev. He had left his United States tour and returned home to enlist in the army to fight for his country. His video captivated the hearts and minds of Ukrainians across the country and was shared by millions in Ukraine and around the world. Public transportation had the song playing daily. People of all ages, from elderly to rebellious teenagers, sang it publicly and privately. My two-year-old daughter was singing the song while eating her cereal. The melody became one of the most popular ringtones. Dozens of videos circulated on the web with each line of the song sung by someone in a different country, from Argentina to Scotland to India, everyone showing solidarity with the Ukrainian people by singing this Kazakh song. Each singer became a fighter for the Ukrainian nation, a modern day Kazakh. Kazakhs also loomed large in a visual representation of the war. The Cossack Mamai was an imperturbable Cossack figure from 18th century folk pictures called Lubok, often seen as uh, um, embodiment of, uh, as the embodiment of stamina, peace, and patience. He smoked a pipe and played a turban under the tree from which his saber hung. His settled stallion rested in the background. The modernized Cossack Mamai appeared in Ukrainian posters, caricatures, and memes as a defender of Ukraine. His robust figure was drawn in the shape of Ukrainian landscape, rocks, hills, and woods. His turban took the shape of a multiple missile launcher placed on an anti-craft vehicles. Another image showed Mamai playing his turban while a Turkish-made drone in the backdrop bombed Russian positions. In honor of the Turkish contribution to the Ukrainian arsenal, Mamai sang Bayraktar, the name of the Turkish drones used by the Ukrainian defense. Ukrainians used images of Cossacks to convey their self-image. In the 1880s, Ilya Repin, a prolific Russian artist of Ukrainian descent, created a work called Reply of the Zaporizhian Cossacks to the Turkish Sultan. Repin extolled the recklessness, fearless defiance, and dazzling courage of the Ukrainian Cossacks. In the painting, they are crowded around the scribe to whom they dictate, laughing, what to write, and how to mock the Sultan, one of their arch enemies. During the war, Ukrainian humorists transferred the bravado of the 17th century Cossacks to 2022. The Cossacks appear with their faces twisted with mockery with President Biden as their scribe. The defense forces of Ukraine and Ukrainians in general re reimagined themselves as a Cossack nation. One popular cartoon had a huge siege tower on the right side with the Russian Federation banner and the Russian wartime marker Z. From the tower, Russian, Russians dressed as pirates led their bloody attacks trying to capture a fortress. On the left side was a fortress adorned with the banner of the European Union. From the convenient distance of the fortress ramparts, Europeans in tuxedos and ball gowns observed the battle through the opera glasses. In the front of the fortress was an outpost, Ukraine, on the bastions of which the entire Ukrainian nation dressed in the Cossack garb repelled the attacking Russians. The message was clear. The Ukrainian people, all Ukrainians, were a Cossack nation, which at the front and in the rear was defending Europe. 
Now Ukrainians could leave behind the infer their inferiority complex and the sense of self-flattery when singing, we are the brethren of the Cossack stock. To Putin's charging, not only Ukrainians, but also dozens of ethnic non-Ukrainians adopted this new identity. And uh, I know that from the uh, kind of firsthand experience. We will ask you to teach for us. Vladislava Moskalets from the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv told me in early March 2022. Our students opted for the course on Jews and Ukrainians. It was quite a surprise that students requested this remote learning course at a time when they were hiding in bomb shelters. I expected them to choose something more relaxing. Instead, those students in Lviv, in the midst of war, asked for the very complex relations between two ethnicities coexisting on Ukrainian lands for the last millennium. Students were reacting to Putin's denazification agenda, most likely. The Russian leader claimed that Ukrainians were petty Nazis, Benderites, ears to Holocaust perpetrators, and that the government in Kyiv was run by xenophobic nationalists and also drug addicts. The student's response was straightforward. Let's study Jewish history in Ukraine and prove that we are not what Putin claims. Their vision of Ukraine as a multi-ethnic nation had deep historical roots. In the wake of the destalinization in the late 1950s, 1960s, Ukrainian and Jewish intellectuals realized that their cultures had been russified, their historical memories suppressed, their national minority schooling limited or destroyed. The first to protest this predicament were Ukrainian dissidents, whom the Soviet authorities portrayed as fascistic, fascistic nationalists seduced by the West. In 1966, several Ukrainian activists attended an unofficial rally commemorating the 25th anniversary of the Nazi massacre of Kievan Jews at Babin Yar. At the rally, Ukrainian literary critic Ivan Zuba, about whom I gave a presentation two years ago at Harvard, boldly st stated that Babin Yar is our shared tragedy. But Zuba, both the Nazis and the Soviets had repressed human dignity and promoted xenophobia, humiliating Jews and Ukrainians alike. Immediately after the 1991 Declaration of Independence, each Ukrainian president has appeared at the annual Babin Yar commemoration. The first Ukrainian president, Leonid Kravchuk, on the left on the screen, apologized publicly to the Jews for the co collaboration of Galician nationalist parties with the Nazis during the war. He was the only post-Soviet president to attend the 1992 International Conference on Anti-Semitism in Brussels, where he reinforced the Ukrainian government's strong will to promote the development of Jewish life in Ukraine and combat anti-Semitism. Speaking before the Israeli Knesset, Kravchuk, reiterated that Ukraine defended ethnic, cultural, linguistic, and religious differences. The first Ukrainian ambassador to Israel, Yuri no, Shchabak, no, a writer- I'm so sorry to interrupt you for a second. I don't think we see your, your pictures. Uh, so I was wondering if you could share them. I apologize profusely for interrupting you. So you do not see what is on the screen? I don't believe so. Uh, so do you, do you mind just sharing them and then we will continue? I'm sharing everything, you know, uh, yeah. my screen. Okay, let, let me let me unshare again. And uh... yeah, the, I actually didn't think you had the pictures until a minute ago. I thought maybe you were going to start showing them in a little while. So I let, have, uh, look, I uh, have. Uh, let's just, for, for let's every just. Part of my presentation, I have pictures. Give me one second. Of course, of course. And Give this is second. absolutely so that is That is funny. Um. I don't know how to, uh, the system doesn't allow me to. Okay, do you see the pictures? Um, we don't. 
but you don't once you, you, okay. you should be able to share the screen so just once just please pick the you know when you go on sharing pick the screen that you see you have to uh, to share those screens whatever you have. yeah i did share the screen from the very beginning and i did not unshare it give me one second please mm -hmm. let me do this let me do this again okay i'm sharing the screen ah now Okay, so look, you should have told me from the very beginning. You so. see, I was not 100% sure until a minute ago when you referred to something that you were actually showing. That. So I'm glad we're on the same page. I apologize again for interrupting. Okay, um, so where are we? We we're are here. here. Okay. Exactly here. Okay. So. Um, let me uh let me continue so the first ukrainian ambassador to israel uh, uh yuri sherbak a writer and medical doctor hung a photo in his tel aviv office of ukrainians dressed as cossacks eating passover matzo sherbak was uh, unequivocal the horrible blood libel known to kievans as the 1911 bailey's case had to be thrown into the garbage bin of history. While my students in Lviv were studying Ukrainian Jewish history, Jewish citizens of Ukraine joined the resistance immediately and en masse. In Dnipro, at a kosher restaurant in the 18th story Jewish community center, Menorah, my attention was drawn to a strong looking individual with a Dumbledore style gray beard. It was Asher Cherkasky, a refugee from occupied Crimea. He had resettled in Dnipro in 2014 and became a visible figure in the community. He had already fought for the territorial integrity of Ukraine in 2014. The moment the war broke in 2022, he and his son David joined the defense forces of Ukraine as uh, the organizers of the military equipment supply for the frontline troops. In his fluent Hebrew, David Cherkasky told the Israeli media that everyone in Europe was wrong about Ukrainians. No, David was not afraid, and he had already seen combat successfully repelling the paramilitary Chechen troops that Putin considered his most effective fighters. David joked with bravado about those Chechen mercenaries. We invited them for shashlik, and we turned them into shashlik. Yes, Ukrainians defending Dnipro were waiting for Russians, David explained, to show them what they would never get. Jewish symbols appeared on Ukrainian military paraphernalia. For the volunteer Israelis, the military authorities added a Hebrew inscription, Ukraine, above that of the Ukrainian defense forces. The red and black flag uh, of the uh, World War II Ukrainian Insurrection Army with a six-pointed star adorned the barracks of the Ukrainian army units where Jews served. On Passover, Jewish soldiers came together to eat matzah at the Ukrainian chief rabbinate, which has its own coat of arms, consisting of the, tab uh, of the tablets with the Ten Commandments and a trident in the form of an open holy ark. The inscription is in Hebrew and Ukrainian, with the title of the organization crowning the coat of arms. It's on uh, the left-hand side of this picture. About 5,000 Ukrainian Jews reportedly joined the troops, the territorial defense, and the army supply lines, three, four times higher than the ratio of Jews to the general population in Ukraine. The presence in the Ukrainian troops proves that Putin falsehood about the xenophobic Ukraine are dead wrong. Russian TV anchors have tried to brainwash the public with stories about Ukrainian anti-Semitism, but they miss one crucial point, the reality on the ground. To underscore the common Jewish and Ukrainian fate in the context of imperial aggression, the Ukrainian media circulated a map with the sites of mass executions of Ukrainian citizens. Dotting the north, east, and south of Ukraine, those many sites were marked as one Babi Yar after another. 
the, re the reality was evident also um, in large posters on the streets of Odessa uh, with three anchors symbolizing the seaport. One, a menorah for the Jews, one, an Eastern Orthodox cross for the Christians, and one, a crescent for the Muslims. The inscription read, there are no aliens in Odessa, but there were also no aliens in Ukraine, especially among those who were joining the Ukrainian military resistance to the Russian aggression. In uh, 2019, a lecture trip brought me to Rivne, where about 50 people gathered in a small bookstore to listen to my book presentation. A man in his mid-50s with formidable facial features was sitting in the first row. This was Maxim Hon, Rivne University Professor of Political Science and author of important studies of local Jewish history and a scholar of the Holocaust in Western Ukraine. Hon was exempt from joining the army as a professor, yet he enlisted at the Donetsk Front in spring 2022. He had been teaching students about civic duty and the necessity to defend one's right to freedom, he said in an interview. He was now practicing what he had preached. Like his Ukrainian brethren, Hon had no desire to see his country become, as he said, an internal colony of the Russian Empire again, unquote. The multinational Ukrainian army was comprised of thousands of non-ethnic Ukrainians, including, but not only, Jews. Each of them could repeat the lines from Lina Kostenko's historical novel in verse, Berestechko, which she puts in the mouth of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, leader of the 1648-1649 Cossack Revolution. Yajne muisei, narod narani rana, moje chulo pobila se vina. Kudi iti, zemlja obitovanna, vana špid nami, naša, ось vana. I'm no Moses. My people is a wound on a wound. My head has turned entirely gray. Where to go? The promised land is beneath our feet. It is ours. This is it. Viktor Troshki was a professor of physics and mathematics at the Uzhgorod University. An ethnic Hungarian, he lived in Transcarpathia, the land of his forefathers. Although he had full exemption from service, he volunteered in the defense forces of Ukraine in the first days of the war, joined the 128th Mountain Brigade, and due to his exceptional mathematical skills, he became a much sought after artillerist. He slept on the floor of the ruined huts, ate hot food only once a day, and, rejoined, uh, and rejoiced uh, whenever he was able to text his family. Then in the midst of the war, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences awarded him with a special distinction uh, for his significant contribution to science, but Troshki did not leave his comrades in arms to travel to Budapest for the award. His choice was not only ideological. The Soviets had occupied Transcarpathia and deported his grandparents to Eastern Ukraine just because they were Hungarians. Troshki did not want to see that brutality happen again. Romantic freedom fighter Mamuka Mamush, uh, Mamulashvili was born in Georgia and ran away from home to fight the Russian invaders in Georgia when he was a teenager. He was wounded, taken prisoner, exchanged, and in 2014, moved to Ukraine. He joined the Ukrainian army and helped check the advance of the Russia-supported separatists in the Luhansk and Donetsk region. Awarded for his service, Mamuka brought together Georgian soldiers and established the Georgian National Legion, the first national minority unit in the Ukrainian army. In the summer of 2022, the Georgian Legion, under Mamulashvili's command, now part of the 52nd um, Ukrainian Defense Forces Brigade, numbered some uh, 3,000 men, 60% of whom were Georgians, and the rest came from more than 30 different countries, including Japan and the United States. Why was he fighting for Ukraine? Mamuka responded that 20% of his native Georgia had been occupied by the Russian troops, just as was happening in Ukraine, where 18% uh, of uh, the Ukrainian territory is occupied. Victory in Ukraine was the key to the, to the liberation of Georgia, he said. 
The success of Ukrainian troops on a battlefield was also crucial for the liberation of Crimea. This was crystal clear for a colonel of the Ukrainian Air Defense Forces, Mustafa, whose last name is classified. Like dozens of other Crimean Tatars among the Ukrainian troops, Mustafa was born in Central Asia, where Stalin deported 180,000 Crimean Tatars in 1944. His family returned to Crimea only in the late 1980s, right before Ukraine regained its independence. Mustafa had seen that so-called Russian liberation would bring nothing but new repressions against Crimean Tatars. When the military authorities called for, for joining the occupational regime, he left and went to fight with the Ukrainian army. Another Mustafa, Mustafa Jemilev, summed up what, he, what was occurring in Ukraine in 2022 and 2023. A Crimean Tatar national leader who spent long terms in a Soviet prison and was persecuted by the Russian occupational troops, Jemilev maintained that only in Ukraine can Benderites protect synagogues. Can there be defense units made up of hundreds of Jews and Russians who have become Ukrainian nationalists and Crimean Tatars chanting, Crimea is Ukraine? Hanna Skoreiko, professor of history at Chernivtsi National University, wrote to me in October 2022. We have already achieved a qualitatively new level of nation making. There is a sense of an irreversible upward movement. We are participants in some extraordinary civilizational brew, uh, as she says. Um, um, Ми є учасниками якогось надзвичайного цивілізаційного варива. So some extraordinary civilizational brew, the contours and characteristics, consistency and taste of which are still unclear. Yet this will be definitely something new. The Ukrainian resistance altered the character of the Ukrainian people. Ukrainians discovered who they were and what they stood for, and they were radically changed. They became people of the Kazakh stock walking with their legs straight and their heads raised. Ukrainians paid exceptionally high price for this self-discovery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanon. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Petrovsky Stern, for this very moving and deeply informative presentation. And I apologize again that I had to interrupt you, but at least we got to see most of the slides. Uh, right. I can go yes. over them and, and just uh, point, uh, uh, point. In, in fact, I actually think it's a great idea. Do you want to just show the... Right, of course. Part? Yeah. Of course. Just, just to say, this is what I was talking about. Exactly. This is I think what it's I meant. a great okay. idea. Let's, okay. let's start from... Let's start from here. Let's make sure that uh, <laughs> you see what is on the screen. Okay, Wonderful. this is Alex Motel with who I had uh, this conversation um, in 1993, was my first lecture at Columbia University. Um, uh, this is the bus to Tarasovchenko wounded uh, in Borodyanka. It's, it's a Kiev district, uh, heavily bombed by Russians. And <clears throat> they also, I believe, shoot the monument. Um, Catherine the Great, um, established in 2007, removed in 2022. Um, a scene, a last scene, uh, again, very much uh, Nabucco style, very much Verdi style. Um, uh, Zaporozhye Zadunayim, um, uh, Zaporizhian Kazakh uh, behind the Danube River, uh, where the chorus, as if they are Jews in Babylonian bondage, is singing. Um, um, uh, conveying their desire to, to go back to Ukraine and reunite with their people. Uh, Pavlo Chubinsky um, and Mikhail Verbitsky, uh, the authors of the song that became Ukrainian national anthem with the line, uh, we are the people of Kazakh stock, um, or we are Kazakh brethren. There are different ways to convey uh, uh, the, to translate um, um, uh, the, the, the line uh, in the stanza, Shume Kozatsko Rodu. Um, uh, Stepan Chernetsky, uh, the author of uh, uh, Red the Burnham song, um, oh, in on this you know kitsch uh, type of uh, of a postcard. 
uh, Andrei Hlivniuk uh, singing um, in the in a very cold you know, on a very cold day. Uh, you know, you do not see that uh, it's freezing cold in Kiev, like, like minus 18 degrees Celsius. And he's uh, sitting uh, uh, with the uh, St. Sophia Cathedral behind him. It's it's not uh, a photoshopped uh, photo. He is he is standing there and, and people are moving in his, um, uh, you know, uh, behind his back. Uh, this was what galvanized uh, the... Uh, people um, who support Ukraine around the world, making the song extremely popular. So these are the Cossacks that I was showing with a Lubok type of picture on the left and how it is transformed into modern day uh, MAMS um, cartoons, caricatures uh, to convey um, what is going on in Ukraine and to connect the Ukrainian people fighting today uh, to the Cossacks of the 18th century. Um, uh, the same topic already um, uh, on the uh, canvas of um, Ilya Repin um, and uh, the version of modern day version of uh, of the scribe who is uh, President Biden, uh, with the same Cossacks now exemplifying the entirety of the Ukrainian people. So, and and then um, this caricature that really gives the idea of how Ukrainians see themselves. And um, uh, it is it is a very high. I would say this is a very high quality. Um, uh, political cartoon, uh, exceptionally uh, charged with meaning, um, and we can discuss, you know, different parts of it and different meanings of it. Uh, but I believe the idea is quite clear that you that Ukraine is defending uh, Europe from uh, barbarians. And then we got to something that uh, you already saw. So let me stop here and and see whether we have questions. May I stop sharing screen? Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, while it, we anticipate my my apology for the glitch, you know, I was no, absolutely no, no. confident that at the moment I showed you during the uh, you know, the tryout the, uh, um, uh, the, the the screen that everything was you know uh, ready to go. Yeah. No, this is great. Uh, and uh, while we anticipate some questions, perhaps uh, I could uh, pick up the thread here, um, which is an invitation for you to elaborate on some of the fascinating and I might say very intellectually provocative in the good sense of it, inviting further uh, discussion and debate, some of the observations that you made. And uh, one of them, I think you made a particularly strong case uh, for recognizing that uh, the war, however traumatic, uh, barbaric, destructive it has been for Ukraine and her people, has also, in the words of one of your informants, uh, Hannes Koreka, has uh, taken Ukrainian, uh, the making of the Ukrainian nation to a new level. I think that's a particularly strong case that you've been making, that one of the paradoxes is that Ukraine's uh, minorities, its uh, ethnic, uh, ethno-religious minorities, have probably felt more Ukrainian than ever uh, over the past uh, uh, year and uh, uh, months or so of the war. I am very convinced uh, by that argument. And I see some of that in my own work, particularly on uh, doing uh, some work recently on Jewish religious leaders and other religious leaders in wartime Ukraine. Um, however, I wonder if you could help us uh, uh, with uh, the inevitable problem, which is uh, how for some of uh, Ukraine's uh, uh, ethno-religious minorities, particularly Ukraine's Jews and Ukraine's Poles, some of the legacy that symbolizes uh, Ukrainian patriotism, her resistance, her military and spiritual fervor, the legacy that uh, in your argument goes back to the uh, Cossacks of uh, Zaporizhia, also symbolizes uh, a history of uh, uh, violence uh, and uh, how we live uh, with that. I'm not saying that it is a problem for the argument you've made in your talk, but it certainly 
could be seen as a problem in the way, for instance, the Jews uh, who have roots in Ukraine and the majority of Soviet Jews have roots in Ukraine. I myself, uh, two of my grandparents were born and grew up in communist. My grandmother was born in Bar, and grew up in Kharadok, the one that's close to Vinnytsia. So in other words, this connection is uh, deeply personal and how to untangle these things, I think uh, probably merits a uh, conversation in which people like you should be having the upper hand. Right. Thank you. Um, um, I would say three things. First, um, uh, of course, uh, there is something that I'm uh, uh, purposefully omitting in, in that subchapter of my hopefully would be book. Um, uh, and that's the conversation. OK, if you are embracing the Kazakh identity, how about the fact that in the 17th century, in the 18th century um, um, and, and also later, uh, let's say in the uh, during the Second World War, during the First World War, um, uh, Cossacks were uh, uh, very much implicated in um, uh, mass violence against Jews, against Mennonites, against other and the religious minorities. Well, um, this is number one question. Number two question: uh, What do you do uh, with the fact that um, uh, Putin's propaganda uh, constantly, consistently reminds us for last, let's say, 10, 15 years? That the moment Ukrainians um, are uh, starting to fight for their independence, they start beating the Jews. Well, uh, let me combine these two questions and and try to answer them um, in uh, in a succinct manner. Number one, um, Ukrainian Cossacks, uh, or let's say uh, simply Cossacks, who uh, later were seen by the Ukrainians as the founders of the nation in the 17th century, in in the 18th century. Uh, were fighting anti-colonialist wars, and they were fighting against uh, the um, uh, oppressing Poles. Um, and of course, uh, Poles were using uh, Jews as uh, instrumental in colonizing um, uh, Central and Eastern Ukrainian um, areas. That's That goes without saying. So what do we do with that particular legacy? Well, we'll look at this particular legacy um, uh, starting from the moment when Ukraine regained its independence from 1991 uh, till today. So uh, Ukrainians regained their independence and started to build a state which is multicultural um, before, before uh, you know, Canadian, uh, American uh, motives of multiculturalism uh, really uh, 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 become uh, overwhelmingly accepted in Europe. Uh, Ukrainian um, um, governments, whatever they are, they might be... Uh, uh, extremely pro-Russian, such as Yanukovych is one, or uh, moderately pro-Ukrainian, such as Yushinsko is one. Uh, Yushinsko is one. Um, uh, they, uh, without any kind of difference, they they support uh, uh, multi-ethnic uh, vision of Ukraine and tolerance toward uh, toward minorities. So uh, the reality on the ground for the last 30 years has been very different. So what I'm describing, uh, what is happening in 2022, is the result of these 30 years of consistent um, um, adaptation of the multi-ethnic um, model of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. Um, and uh, that is something new that has not been the case in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And uh, uh, because uh, that that is a, a, a mighty trend in Ukrainian politics and on the ground, um, uh, that trend really uh, kind of crystallized itself and became particularly uh, obvious uh, for the inside and outside observers um, in 2022. So. Uh, it is something new for people who know nothing about Ukraine over the last 30 years. And it is quite challenging for people who see Ukraine and Ukrainians through the eyes of uh, 1648 uh, uh, mass violence of Khmelnytsky's troops uh, against, um, against practically everybody. Um, uh, you know, um, people look at uh, 1648 Cossack revolution um, as it was called by Ores Subtelny, uh, not just a rebellion. It was really a revolution um, as um, uh, something that um, uh, exemplifies the um, violence of the Cossacks. You know, 1648 is the last year of 30 years war. During the 30 years war, one third excuse me, one third of the European population, forget about Ukraine, forget about Poland, one third of, your, of, of the European population was decimated, okay? So you are talking about the continuation of the same events uh, in the center of which we should place uh, not the troops, 
of ratars or uh, of, of Polish cavalry, but we should place the peasant rebellion. Peasant rebellion is a horrible, uh, uh, catastrophic thing that nobody can control and uh, uh, nobody can uh, kind of uh, run and rule uh, or, or channel in, into this or that direction. So Cossack rebellion uh, that joined uh, the Cossack, uh, peasant rebellion that joined the, the, the Cossack troops was the same peasant rebellion you see in Europe. One third of Europeans were gone by 1648. So at that point, Ukrainian peasant rebellion starts. So we had to place uh, the uh, victimization um, as much as we do not like it into a comparative context and see things in context, right? Nobody sees the Cossack rebellion in the context of 30 years war, but it is. Uh, and it is, you know, the same territory, the same armies are uh, um, uh, fighting, uh, people who are fighting with Khmelnytsky and people, uh, and Khmelnytsky himself were fighting during this 30 years war for the armies. Um, in Central Europe, so that is that is one thing. Another thing is, of course, um, what to do with uh, Putin's propaganda. Well, you just say that for the last thirty years, Ukraine was a different country, and I would say, you know, uh, take a look at this, get by the book. It is relatively an expensive book uh, for the coffee table book with um, three hundred illustrations and thirty maps. Um, um, and uh, the book does tell you what Ukraine is about, not only uh, from the times of memorial uh, until 1991, but also what Ukraine is about uh, in the diaspora after 1991 and today over the last 30 years, at least over the last you know, 20 years. And um, my, um, um, uh, my colleague, uh, my senior colleague from the University of Toronto, Paul Robert Magachi and, and, and myself, we're trying to do whatever we could to show uh, that uh, Ukraine changed and changed drastically and changed radically um, uh, once uh, the um, new ideas promoted by the dissidents of Ukraine as a tolerant multi-ethnic um, uh, uh, political entity uh, uh, were implemented uh, in this or that manner by different Ukrainian governments, and of course by Ukrainian intelligence and by Ukrainian political bemoan. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, and perhaps I, I actually think the argument about uh, the 30 year war is a novel and a powerful one, and I'd like to uh, compliment you on it. Uh, I think it adds uh, perspective and granularity. And I think it also, of course, uh, highlights uh, that there's large scale violence uh, elsewhere on the European uh, scene. Um, that being what it may, perhaps uh, if we could just get something uh, uh, um, out of uh, the way, I think, of course, the question that keeps coming up, and uh, I see it coming up uh, from uh, the uh, members of the Jewish community in the United States, in Israel, from academics, uh, from intellectuals, from uh, pundits, which the question having to do not what happened in the 17th century, but of course, the tremendously uh, thorny question of uh, uh, World War II and the Shoah. And uh, again, I think uh, it must be, and I think your uh, example should be emulated, approached not hysterically, but historically. And yet, uh, I do think that the history of what was happening in Ukrainian lands during World War II and the Shoah is uh, with us still today. And again, please enlighten us uh, in terms of uh, how, uh, not so much to understand what happens, that's not what I'm saying, but uh, to give you an example, I follow various uh, uh, mm, mm, figures in Ukraine, including members of the Jewish community. There is, uh, I think, a very brave person by the name of Eduard Dalinsky, who is a kind of regular barometer of what's going on with uh, Ukraine's Jews, uh, who is, I think, a fervent patriot of Ukraine. So uh, he recently uh, highlighted the uh, case of the decision 
by uh, Kiev's uh, city council to name a street after Andriy Melnik. And uh, this is controversial. And I would like to know how you as an historian, as a Ukrainian patriot and as a, and as a Jew, approach it to, in, today's, uh, in today's context. Okay, two things. Uh, 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 not out of uh, disrespect to you, Max, uh, but out of disrespect to Eduard Dolinsky. I do not consider him a person who is um, an expert in Ukrainian Jews. I do not consider him a person who knows what is going on in the Jewish communities. I consider him a puppet, uh, mostly of Kolomoisky, mostly of the pro-Russian Ukrainians, and mostly of people who want to see Ukraine uh, returned to the kind of Soviet um, ideological, uh, under Soviet ideological umbre umbrella, only without uh, socialist Soviet slogans. I have deep disrespect of this person. I do not consider him any kind of expert. And people who are um, uh, uh, talking to him and to me, I delete from my Facebook page. Okay, so that will tell you something. There so are many be, people. I'm going to be deleted. Is that okay. what you said? Well, there are many people. Just, just <laughs> watch. Watch your step. Watch your step. There are many people who follow him. He has uh, dozens of hundreds, uh, dozens, uh, dozens of thousands of of people who follow him, uh, and who listen to him. Um, uh, he is. Um, he presents himself as a historian. He is not. He presents himself as a journalist. He's a very low key journalist, and. Uh, uh, what he knows about Ukrainian history, he knows from uh, the Putin, from Putin propaganda and from the Soviet textbooks. Okay, so uh, never mention this name to me. I would not be responding to what he says because it is it is a misnomer for me to talk to, about Eduard Dolinsky. But let me ask you about something different. How do you deal with the Holocaust um, um, in Ukraine, uh, with the Holocaust on Ukrainian lands? with the participation of some Ukrainian organized groups um, uh, in the mass murder of the Jews, with the um, enticement uh, that you do see among um, uh, uh, radical uh, Ukrainian nationalists um, against all sorts of minorities, including Moskalizhi uh, de uh, Ilyachi, Russians, Poles, and, and Jews. What do you do with that? Well, uh, what I suggest doing, since it is not my immediate subject matter, I suggest looking at the uh, second at, at the secondary sources and at the newly emerging primary sources. So um, um, I believe uh, the book by um, um, uh, uh, by um, uh, Brendan and Lower uh, on the on, on the show in Ukraine uh, is a very good book uh, available in Ukrainian and in um, and in English. Uh, does give you uh, different ideas of how to deal with Shaw. I believe. Uh, an excellent article by Alex Motil uh, in the volume that I published um, in um, uh, twelve in 2011, uh, together with uh, Anthony Polonsky, uh, my um, uh, uh, dissertation partner. Um, um, this Motel article also shows you uh, how to deal with this subject matter. I can name uh, some other important sources that question uh, what uh, people uh, think, what people know, and what people claim. Uh, in what way? Uh, first and foremost, uh, there is this stereotype that uh, Ukrainians, uh, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainians who were kind of cognizant of the Ukrainian ethnic, uh, ethnic national identity, um, uh, were uh, very much pro-Nazi, and uh, they uh, gladly welcomed uh, the Nazis and uh, uh, participated in whatever Nazis had uh, for the Jews uh, in stock. Uh, false. Uh, uh, most Ukrainians, I would say absolute majority of Ukrainians, uh, were so tired uh, by uh, the um, uh, ethnic, uh, and uh, I would say even class, cleansing in the 1930s, uh, first by Stalin and then by uh, by the Nazis, uh, that they were uh, simply neutral uh, uh, toward what is going on uh, in the country. Not because they were neutral, but because they were, you know, uh, shoveled into into this neutrality by uh, by ten years of constant class cleansing. Um, uh, I'm discussing this issue in my uh, review, in, in my interview uh, about the Loznitsa film dedicated to Babin Yar, published uh, a week ago in, in Kritika in Kiev. Uh, so uh, this stereotype of Ukrainians helping the Nazis um, is wrong also uh, because it was uh, 
only very little minority uh, of the uh, Ukrainians engaged politically who were supporting uh, uh, mass ethnic uh, cleansings uh, in Ukraine. These were influential people. These were people with arms. They were people supported uh, uh, by, let's say, uh, uh, the uh, Wehrmacht um, task to uh, annihilate all the Jews um, in uh, on, the, on the Ukrainian territory. But it turns out that these people found it very difficult to get their radical ideas to, for example, auxiliary polizei, to uh, to Hilfspolizei in Ukraine. Uh, my um, graded student, uh, um, Anastasia Novotorska, uh, found uh, dozens of documents that uh, reflect that particular difficulty. Uh, you know, we think that uh, all Ukrainian Hilfspolizei are, uh, you know, cognizant Ukrainians who come to uh, help Nazis to kill the Jews. And, and it turns out that, that those radical Ukrainians who want to kill the Jews cannot become part of Hillspolizei, and Hillspolizei is something different. Uh, my colleague, um, uh, my younger colleague um, in Ukraine, uh, uh, Yuri Rachenko, has shown that Hillspolizei, um, that was uh, quite often engaged by the Nazis um, in the um, acts of, let's say, rounding up the Jews, um, exporting, uh, transporting Jews to the sites of mass murder, uh, that Hillspolizei actually uh, was uh, Ukrainian only nominally. It was territorially and not ethnically uh, organized um, uh, institution. So they were among those Hillspolizei with Ukrainian um, insignia. They were Hungarians, Poles, enormous amount of Russians, uh, POWs, um, um, and, you know, some Ukrainians. So um, uh, now you are telling me uh, uh, that Dolinsky says they are all Ukrainians. Well, false. So uh, actually, I'm sorry, is... I did not do anything. Uh, OK, OK. So, so, so what I'm trying to do, to what say, I'm trying to say. Uh, and I actually listen to different voices because I think different Thank voices. God contribute to the conversation and give you the sense of the temperature of the discourse. So uh, you have every right to disrespect uh, one person or another. I uh, reference this because uh, this is a conversation that is happening uh, and with an audience of thousands and thousands, not because right, I right. disagree. And in so this conversation, why... can I, I just want to finish. In this conversation, the question is not what happened. The question is what place War it has in today's construction of Ukraine's multi ethnic and multinational oh. memory. To okay. me, this is the question. Okay, thank you, thank you. That is that that really changes uh, changes the uh, uh, the perspective. Um, now we are saying how people remember uh, those. Um, leaders of uh, uh, Ukrainian nationalists, uh, such as Bandera or Melnik, uh, why do they sing Batko Nash Bandera, uh, Our Father Bandera? Why they uh, raise Bandera on, on the banners um, of uh, Ukrainian resistance and why they make such a big deal out of it? Uh, my first answer is because of ignorance. Uh, for most people, Bandera is important, Melnik is important because they fought both the Nazis and the Bolsheviks, starting from 1944 onward. Not because they killed the Jews, not because they they they, they um, uh, cleansed the Poles, but because they were fighting the Bolsheviks. So for Ukrainians, that is an important thing. Ukrainians, first, do not know. Second, what they do know, they take only one part of it. They see these people as the participants of the resistance to the Bolsheviks, to the Russians, and they see those and they see this resistance as something that they continue today. So they need to build on something. They need historical backdrop, and uh, because of uh, of their very limited vision and their very little understanding of who these people were, they take them and put them on the banners. Now. If you tell these people, you know, Bandera and Melnik could not really be uh, your leaders, would anything change? No. Would you say that if you are subscribing to Bandera and Melnik, you also have to subscribe to their xenophobic views? Well, it doesn't work. This is not what is happening. You have to you, you have to see how people apprehend, um, you know, inter uh, interiorize. Uh, and what they do with these names and 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 the slogans of these people, and they do not um, see the adherence to these people as uh, the um, allegiance that uh, immediately uh, presupposes 
uh, the necessity to kill or cleanse ethnic minorities in Ukraine. It doesn't work. Okay. So, and uh, I do not see Jews singing Batko Nash Bendera, right? But I do see Jews, Poles, Hungarians, Crimean Tatars, um, um, uh, uh, people from Chechnya, people from Georgia, um, uh, people from different religions and different um, uh, ethnic national groups in Ukraine supporting Ukrainian national resistance on all levels. Okay. Um, as the organizers of the centers, uh, for refugees, um, as uh, the uh, suppliers um, um, of the weapon and, uh, you know, warm uh, things to the front line, um, as people who are in the territorial defense, as people who are in the trenches, okay? So that is something that we have to take into consideration. Yes, you might not like that, uh, you know, uh, the street is named after Melnik. Uh, well, we have to deal with that. We have to use um, uh, our lever, we have to use our influence, we have to use our, you know, this, pati this particular uh, uh, um, uh, moment to say that there could be uh, people of a much greater impact and much greater importance for the Ukrainians, um, uh, you know, beyond those um, uh, political leaders uh, of the Second World War um, uh, who uh, were uh, were not supported uh, by the Nazis. Um, the first day of the war, uh, Ivan Zuba, the great Ukrainian uh, uh, literary critic, a literary figure, um, uh, speaker, writer, and, and thinker, passed away. Um, and um, I think that uh, uh, Zuba can be this kind of um, uh, of a um, of a person that. Um, around whom and around whose ideas uh, you can rally the entire nation, right? And um, while people who are in their post-colonial situation uh, are taught to think uh, about political and military leaders as the leaders. So Stalin is removed, long live Brezhnev. Brezhnev is removed, long live Zhukov. Zhukov is removed, uh, you know, long live Bandera. So uh, that shows you consistency, right? So uh, in the colonial countries and in the post-colonial countries, uh, the military and political leaders are seen as the leaders, not the cultural figures, okay? Yeah, no, need... no, this is, you made a very strong case for that. And I absolutely agree with you. It's just, I think the problem is that we're dealing with selective uh, cultural amnesia. And uh, of course, this is not the time we can diagnose it. This is not the time to cure it. The time now is to win the war for Ukraine. And right. uh, I pray fervently for her, you know, fast victory. But I think uh, if I uh, may so speculate, I think the uh, future of uh, minorities in the national discourse on Ukraine's memory is riddled with these questions. And I don't see a way of going around this, uh, which right. perhaps leads me perhaps to my final sort of question. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, we have uh, tremendous evidence, some of which you've touched on, and there is uh, a lot more of uh, the uh, way members of Ukraine's uh, ethno-religious uh, minorities have risen to the challenge, have rallied behind the uh, banners of Ukraine, have been parts of her troops, uh, and have been true patriot patriots. We also have some interesting data, specifically in the case of Ukraine's Jews on the uh, Jewish emigration, wartime emigration. Uh, the latest numbers, which I monitor very closely, uh, including because I'm in regular conversation with uh, Mark Toltz, who is a great demographer of uh, Jews in the post-Soviet space at Hebrew University. Over 15,000 uh, came to Israel, made Aliyah. Doesn't mean that they're all halakhically Jews, but they either meet 
the requirements of the law of return, which are minimal, of course, one Jewish grandparent or members of the families of those who do. But nevertheless, this is not a small number. Is it a great number compared to the Jewish outflux from the Russian Federation? Well, that's over 60,000, but it is still a number to contend with. And I would very much like to be enlightened by your thoughts about it. Are we looking at a depletion of uh, Ukraine's uh, Jewish uh, community. Uh, look, uh, I believe one of the um, uh, great uh, 19th century uh, wits said that there are five types of lie, the, 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 the first is statistics. Uh, we really uh, do not know, and we do not know how to count. Um, uh, uh, um, Tol, uh, Tols, who, 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 I'm, uh, who I respect enormously, he, he's an excellent demographer, uh, and uh, Sergio de, de Pergola, exactly. uh, the, the, the top demographer um, of Jewish communities in diaspora in Israel, um, uh, um, are giving us numbers that are provided to them by the leaders of the communities. And um, uh, there is a funny situation that we are uh, witnessing today. So in the 17th century and in the 18th century, in early modern times, um, when you get the official numbers of Jews in this or that community, um, you have to uh, take it with a grain of salt as uh, something which is radically diminished uh, by the Kahal, by the different uh, self-governing um, uh, Jewish organizations. Today, when you see uh, the numbers uh, provided uh, by the uh, Jewish umbrella organizations, you have to take those numbers with a grain of salt, uh, uh, diminishing uh, those numbers. So uh, you have to go up from the numbers you have in the 17th century. You have to go down from the numbers you have uh, to in, in, the, uh, in the 21st century for a very simple reason. Um, the way people pay taxes in uh, 16th, 17th, 18th century is through the community, not individually, okay? So the community is interested not to show the uh, pe people, groups of people, um, um, uh, um, let's say, uh, 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 low lives um, and, um, you know, families of the widows uh, or um, uh, poor families that cannot pay their taxes and the uh, umbrella organizations do not want to be a burden, um, do, do not want uh, these people to be a burden, so they, they do not show them in the census, you know, kind of whatever census they have. So um, I'll give you one example. Uh, when Jews uh, become part of the Russian Empire as the result of the partitions of Poland uh, from 1772 till 1795, uh, the reported numbers uh, by all sources is about uh, 300,000, okay? Um, uh, uh, Weinrub and another of other, uh, and, and Lichinsky, uh, several, you know, very highly qualified um, demographers um, of uh, the 20th century, they triple this number to show that you know we are talking about one million Jews who became part of the uh, of the Russian Empire. So that gives you uh, the, uh, the 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 um, idea of how problematic are the figures today. Um, um, Yosef Zisus, the head of the um, Association of the Jewish Communities um, and Organizations of Ukraine, will give you one number, um, and uh, Sukhnu, Jewish Agency for um, Israel, will give you another number, and the number would be anywhere from seventeen, uh, from seventy seven zero thousand to uh, one hundred seventy thousand people. So you're talking about what, the numbers of the Jews. The in number Ukraine. of the Jews on Ukraine yeah. today. So what is the number of the Jews in Ukraine? Uh, you know. Um, uh, there are people who are emerging uh, on the horizon uh, of the demographers because, you know, they discover their paternal uh, 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 Jewish grandfathers. And suddenly they become part of the pool of the potential aliyah, the potential immigration. So these figures are very problematic. And, um, uh, you know, um, if you look at the emigration of Jews from Ukraine, uh, starting from 1993, roughly 1993, 1994, until uh, 2014, 2015, uh, the Aliyah was very small. Um, and um, it was 16, 20,000 uh, in 93, 94. And then it, then it excuse me, it, it was much higher than that. Uh, and, and then it was about, uh, let's say uh, fourteen to sixteen thousand um, uh, in in the nineteen nineties per year. So if you have this kind of aliyah, there should be no Jews today 
20 years later in Ukraine, right? And uh, uh, the, according to the Association of uh, uh, the Jewish Communities uh, of Ukraine, of, out of Ukraine, you have approximately at least 80,000 Jews in Ukraine. So what do you do with that? So you question the numbers, okay? Absolutely, I agree. No, but just these so numbers therefore, are really... Go ahead. Therefore, my brief answer to, you know, bottom line would be, um, yes, there is uh, there is Aliyah, there is growing Aliyah, but there is um, a core Jewish community that will be there. And uh, and I believe uh, uh, we have to take into consideration that, that before 2014, there were about uh, 15, 20,000 Jews from Israel, Israeli Jews, who came back to Odessa and other um, um, industrial centers to establish their businesses. Uh, uh, they are not Yordim. They are not people who, who are coming back to settle permanently in Ukraine, although they live permanently in Ukraine and they have their businesses, but they do not rescind the Israeli citizenship. So there is an appearing, a newly appearing uh, diasporic Israeli uh, settlement uh, uh, around uh, around Ukraine. These people are in businesses. These people join um, uh, uh, different branches of, of economy. Um, and uh, what do you do with that? So how do you count? How do you count these people? Uh, I believe uh, even uh, my uh, good friend uh, uh, Ziv Khanin, who is uh, the the top expert in Israel on on uh, Aliyah from the former Soviet Union, uh, he, he cannot count uh, these figures and provide you with with um, with a reliable figure. Right, because we there are many things we do not know. We make assumptions. We say this is what is going on. I'm saying I question these numbers. Okay, right. and so, and I do not think that we will see the disappearing Jewish community in Ukraine. Also, because there is a very robust Jewish Ukrainian intelligentsia, and this is and Finberg and 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 uh, and, and Portnikov and 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 uh, dozens of other journalists, um, artists, writers, uh, poets who are living in Ukraine and who are participating in the makeup of of Ukrainian. Um, uh, modern day uh, cultural identity. Thank you, Johanna. Just so you know, I'm referring to, and actually the uh, around 15, 16,000, these are numbers that are uh, generated by Israeli government offices. They are not based on the calculation of the uh, what uh, the Ukrainian Jewish organizations report. So I have the feeling that these are Aliyah numbers based basically on what was punched in in Israel. Well, I take your argument fully, but I think we, I suspect, are in agreement that there is uh, uh, this paradox of, of which I could describe as this. Uh, on the one hand, I think Jews probably feel more welcome than ever in Ukraine and more integrated. It's, a, I think, uh, despite everything, there is such acceptance. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the... Aliyah into Israel over the past many years uh, is going through a spike. And uh, that's what interests me as a cultural historian uh, here. Yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, I guess, uh, Yohanan, maybe uh, if we could just ask you to talk to us uh, very briefly about your most recent visit to Ukraine and give us uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, a personal picture, because I know that uh, you travel there uh and uh, that's great right thank you um i was in ukraine in in september for a couple of days and i was uh, a little bit more than a week in december so let me tell you a brief story and um that will be a nice um kind of uh wrap up of exactly what we were discussing exactly so uh, uh so um december 13th quarter to 4 p.m i'm standing at the um uh, Central Square in uh, the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. Um, um, I needed to pass uh, a package uh, to a person who was collecting things for the families, um, for, for the children of the families uh, whose fathers were killed at the front. So I'm bringing, you know, entire big package of, 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 of uh, things for children, and I'm waiting to pass that to a person. So the person comes, and the moment when the person is with me and I'm passing this package, uh, there is a siren, and everybody has got to go to the shelter. And I, and I say a couple of very bad words, because in 15 minutes, I have to be um, at, uh, you know, three, four minute walk from the place where I am in the center of the city, um, at the Museum of Ethnography, 
which is located in uh, Prospect Svobody, in the uh, um, uh, Freedom Avenue, so to say, uh, the central part uh, of uh, Lviv uh, city center, um, for the book presentation. I came there for the book presentation, and, and I have to present the book uh, published by my colleague, Yuri Birilov. Uh, and this is the book, let me open the um, English uh, title, uh, The Jewish Architectural Legacy of Lviv. Okay, huge book, um, uh, 650 pages, uh, published by Vidovnistva Staroholeva, the old lion uh, publishing house with uh, uh, beautiful uh, newly uh, made illustrations with archival illustrations. And this, this, is, this is really a fantastic book uh, of which I am um, uh, the scholarly editor. So, I have to go to the shelter, but I have to go to the book presentation. Um, I don't know where the shelters are in the center of Lviv. I go to the museum um, and I think there is nobody there. People are sitting in the in, in, in the basement, uh, in, in, in the bomb shelter, and I'll join them there and we'll, can, we'll have some sort of a conversation. So I'm, I'm going to the uh, central hall where we have to have our book presentation. Television is there. The representatives of the, of the um, uh, publishing house are there. Uh, people from the Academy of Sciences are there, people from the Academy of Arts are there, uh, the author of the book is there, and 70 people who are who came to listen to the book presentation are there. And my chin drops because, you know, air raid has not been canceled. So, so, so people are waiting for the, for the bombs and, and missiles to be, uh, 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 to be uh, you know, fired against the um, uh, civ civilians in, in Lviv, Western Ukraine, um, all this area. And people are saying, you know, we will stay. We will stay and we will listen. And uh, that is an amazing uh, negligence on the one hand. On the other hand, it's an amazing stamina. You would not get us, Mr. Putin. We will be here to listen about the architecture, uh, architectural Jewish architectural legacy of Lviv. And uh, look, out of 70 people who were there, uh, plus uh, the representatives of, of the publishing house, plus the, the, the television, um, there was perhaps one person who was Jewish. All others were Ukrainians. So why Ukrainians in the midst of war, in the midst of, of air raid, uh, uh, when the sirens are, uh, uh, you know, uh, really getting into your ears, are coming to listen to that kind of book presentation in the center of Lviv? I will leave this answer, this question unanswered. I believe it has an answer. Uh, I believe my conversation here with you gives an answer, uh, or maybe the answer to this question. Uh, but uh, that was something that I'm learning about Ukraine and Ukrainians from my own experience, and that is very moving. I was, I was really deeply moved by the presence of these people, and I stood up and I said, you know, uh, forget about what we are celebrating today. Forget about the book. Forget about everything. You know. To have you here is is an act of resistance, is an act of cultural resistance, and I thank you for that. And thank I thank you, so you for participating in this conversation. This is a great way, as you put it, to wrap this up, and also gives me an opportunity to thank you so very much for your passion, for your insights, uh, and for your stamina, and uh, for your activism as well, as a Ukrainian, as a Jew, and as uh, an American intellectual. Thank you so much, Professor Petrovsky Stern, and thank you to all of our guests today. Uh, I'm Maxim Schreier, and uh, we will see you at our later events this spring. Thank you. All the best.